schools have been shuttered for weeks across the country. Concerns about coronavirus have led to school shutdowns in almost every state. I no longer have school for the rest of the school year. Disneyland closed, Premier League postponed, NBA postponed, schools closed. I can't stand it. It is extremely boring. School and my home life is basically one and the same. He, he, I'm bad as Michael Jackson. It's not just you. We're all exhausted. Antonio. Antonio! Anyone? Is anyone out there? Hi. Hi, Leo. How's it going? Uh, okay. All right. I never thought I would ever say this, but I miss school. I miss going to school. We're back to learning online. I think I've missed every deadline. I got a lesson in half an hour on Zoom, but there's a million things that I'd rather do. My school year has been so weird so far. Lots of new rules, lots of new procedures. Everybody has to follow them. When I went to school to become a teacher, there was no lesson on how to teach while also being stuck behind a screen. We have two, we have three cameras on! Oh my gosh, it's a world record! <laughs> we have seven cameras on. I'm looking tearing up on the side, you can't tell. My heart is overwhelmed. We don't need to recreate what we had. We don't need to recreate the old magic. We need to create new magic. We need to go forward. We're all in it together. It's just a really weird time to grow up. Those of you who are still here with me, stay here with me. Let's do this. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Disrupted, how COVID-19 changed education. It's been an incredibly difficult year for millions of teachers and students whose lives have been completely upended by the pandemic. Schools are returning in person, but there's a lot of uncertainty about the long-term effects of remote learning, social isolation, the loss of routine and security and normalcy. And we are just beginning to reckon with the systemic inequities and opportunity gaps made even worse by the crisis. To explore the hard questions facing education in America, we spoke with teens, parents, and educators to understand what they've been through and to explore the changes they hope to see as we move into our new normal. Also, and as always, we want to hear from you. So start a conversation in the chat. Drop in your ideas. Send us your questions. We are here live with you now, and we want to know what's on your mind. This program was created by the team at Student Reporting Labs, our youth media program from the News Hour that trains teens to find and produce their own local stories. All right, time to start the show. First, we're going to hear from 17 year old Tiffany Rodriguez in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Now, like millions of others, Tiffany's family has been struggling to afford basic expenses this past year. Throughout the show, you're going to hear more students' pandemic stories, like Tiffany's, and they're going to be narrated by student reporter Jan So Sok from Westview High School in San Diego, California. This school year was a doozy. Things went downhill immediately. Ever since September, everything has just been an uphill climb. Tiffany Rodriguez was out of school for three months this year. At first, her music teacher, Colin Sharp, didn't know why she was absent from their online classes. When I stopped seeing you log in is when I, you know, obviously my first concern started to really set in. So what was happening in like the, that first month of school for you? I ended up having to work and right. work was a battle. It was a war. <laughs> because I ended up having to support my family. I was the only one in the house that was working at the time. I had to take on a lot of hours, including school hours. So I would be <laughs> in orchestra and music class while I was serving smoothies to people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and it was very frustrating because, you know, working at the same time while being at school, you don't really retain anything. And so I, would take any hours I could and because money was short. So I did what I had to do, but then I ended up catching the virus. 
A week after her diagnosis, Tiffany started to feel better and thought maybe she'd sail through it, but then her health went downhill. My doctors almost hospitalized me. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't walk. I couldn't breathe correctly. Tiffany, you are, I mean, you are all smiles right now, which is fantastic. So it, that tells me that you're in a much better place. I feel like um, my last few weeks of having COVID, I really took that time to appreciate who I was and how, what's life going to be like for me and just take things as it comes, you know, really appreciate the little things and be grateful for what you've had. I like who I am now because of this entire experience, this entire situation. Things are better now for Tiffany's family too. She says they're financially stable and she's no longer worried about working all the time. She still has lingering fatigue from her bout with COVID, but she was able to come back to her online classes in March and is busy catching up on what she missed. I know that I speak for not just myself, but a lot of the other teachers at our school when we say we're, we are really, really proud of you. I'm really hoping that my story can set somebody on the right path or inspire somebody even to just, you know, even being pushed down so many times, you can still get back up and get back up even stronger. School looks very different when you're stuck inside, trying to get your work done in homes full of siblings with lots of distractions. NewsHour correspondent William Brangham has that story. This pandemic has obviously been hard on all students, but for some, in addition to doing their own remote school work, some of those students have also had to take on extra responsibilities, helping care for their younger siblings. We want you to meet three young students from across the country who dealt with these very particular challenges. First off, 14-year-old Casey Amaral from Maui. At the beginning of the school year, my parents decided that it would be best for me to do online schooling. But what I didn't know was that I was also going to become a teacher, a security guard, a principal, and a cafeteria worker overnight. Here's what I mean. I have an 11-year-old brother in the fifth grade, Lance, and a nine-year-old sister in the fourth grade, Kira, which means if I'm doing all online school, so are they. The three of us are crammed in a 15-foot room all day for the entire school year. They are always fighting. All I have to do is walk out of the room for 10 seconds and then... Casey! Every day, I have to warm up their lunches and make sure they eat in time to get to their next meeting. Finally, I've been relearning fourth grade math. My sister doesn't like math, so sometimes I have to help her with her homework. This would be fine. If they didn't keep changing math. Every time I try to help her, it's always the same. But that's not how we do it in class. Well, I think my mom's skills are kicking in. But even though they drive me insane, life would be boring and lonely without these little monkeys. Come, Casey, come! So I guess hey. I have to say I still love them, right? <laughs> hey! The next video we want to see is from Southern California, and it's from 18-year-old Ryan Carter. For 18-year-old senior Ryan Carter, distance learning means taking more responsibility as his 15-year-old brother, Ty. There was always um, mix-ups with Zoom, mix-ups with Canvas. And for me and my brother, since he's autistic and deaf, he would react negatively due to the uh, confusion and frustration. I've had to personally assist my brother with um, getting used to the programs to really get ahead and start to learn. Online instructions are puzzling to anyone, but even much so for Ty. It's hard for him to tell me what's really wrong and what he needs to do. He says it in his own way. I respect him and regard him as just my brother. I don't look at him as autistic and deaf. I just see him as another brother that needs help with a problem. It's not that I have to deal with him or anything like that. It's more like he has to deal with me. Lastly, we want to hear from 17-year-old Hannah Gabradul from Houston, Texas. As much as I love my siblings, it can be really hard sometimes, especially with being the second eldest. During quarantine, things haven't gotten easier. 
especially since my parents have been working a lot more all day and sometimes overnight. When it comes to cleaning around the house, I would take up most of the work since my older sister had a lot more on her plate. It was really frustrating at first because I felt like no one else would help. It took a lot of effort and constant lecturing from my mom to get them to help out a lot more. Which is nice because I hardly wash the dishes anymore, but also because I'm seeing them take on a lot more responsibility and becoming more mature. As long as we're not fighting, we're always having a great time together. Whether it be taking a game of cards way too seriously, hanging out with friends. Yes. How do you? I watch so I watch okay. Bella. These moments make everything worth it, and what has been getting me through these hard times. <laughs> I'm so glad to say that we have Casey and Ryan and Hannah here with us now. Thank you all for those beautiful videos that gave us a good sense of really what your year was like. Um, Casey, I want to ask you, when you look back on this year, what was the hardest part of it for you? We had to get used to being in the same classroom all the time. Normally we have about six hours apart at school, but we've been together all day, so we have more chances to get on each other's nerves. Uh, Ryan, to you, you were obviously shouldering a lot of responsibility here, not only doing your own school work, but looking after your brother, Ty. And let's say everyone goes back to school as normal. That's going to probably be difficult for him suddenly not to have you around like he's had. I do believe that he makes friends just as well as other people do and people love him at school and encourage him a lot and those personal feelings and emotions really drive him to want to talk to other people and want to be around other people so it does improve his daily activities. I mean, we all hope that there's never another pandemic like this and we don't have to go through what we went through, but you all have become expert in homeschooling in some way. Like, let's say we had to go do this again, Ryan. What would you tell your teachers and school administrators about how to make this a better process for, for people like you and your brother? People with autism tend to be more strict and hard on themselves to get uh, what they want out and to keep things orderly. So uh, giving them patience and time will definitely allow them to participate just as well as any other student in the class. I'm curious, did you ever have to ask for help with any of this process along the way? Yeah, most definitely. We've been quarantined for about a year and it was like a year long process. It wasn't this easy in the beginning. It was like slowly over time in my own experiences, like trying to take care of them and like get them to do things. Were they able to like actually learn the skills in order to like actually get them to do stuff or actually juggle things going on at home? When you look back on this year, do you think that this will have been a positive experience for you, a mixed experience? How, how do you think you'll see it? I think it'll be both. There were some bad things about it, but there were some good things too. Like my siblings and I, we all got closer. So there's certain things about them. Like when they're lying now, I can tell. <laughs> they make this certain That's a very face. good skill to have. So now they haven't been getting away with as much as they used to. I believe it was positive in where I had some time to myself to also teach myself electronics. I started 3D printing a lot and I began actually creating mask attachments. I saw that people were getting rashes around the ears. I developed a model to 3D print to alleviate that pressure off the ears to put the mask onto the back of the head and to also um, take it directly off the ear. It's fantastic. I wonder what each of you is most looking forward to do that you haven't been able to do this year. Ryan, let's start with you. Oh my gosh, uh, there's so many things I would uh, like to do, like go to a movie theater with my friends and uh, like possibly go to the beach. Uh, one thing pops into mind since I'm in Texas, there's this like sand co castle competition that happens every year in Galveston. And that's something we'd always go to like every summer. And we haven't been able to for the last two summers. So that was a big bummer. So hopefully if it's gonna be this summer, that's definitely something I'm gonna go to with them. And Casey, what are you most looking forward to doing? Go back to in-person school so I can see all my friends again and get away from my brother and sister. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. All right. Thank you all so much for being here today and talking to us and sharing these stories about your pandemic year. Casey Amaral, Ryan Carter, and Hannah Gabradul. Thank you, guys.
During his first year at Cedar Crest High School in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, Dylan Wren was getting good grades and doing well. But when the pandemic hit, everything changed. My mother started working more. I was constantly watching my sister and doing chores and cleaning up the house. I stopped texting family members and close friends because I wasn't seeing them every day like I was when I was coming into school. So I just distanced myself from them. Dylan's school counselor, Jennifer Knight, says she had to start stalking him earlier this year to try to get him back on track. I think that your story is really emblematic of thousands and thousands of students in the nation. You know, ones who were succeeding. I've been a counselor for 13 years and, and never have I ever experienced anything like this, obviously. Um, just the level of um, truancy due to, you know, the online learning and, and just the break in normal education. I lost every single bit of motivation to do what was right for myself at the end of the school year. Dylan's disconnection from school last spring didn't count against him because the district decided not to assign grades. But when school started again in the fall, he was failing. Now let's go to um, January 11th. I actually, it's embedded in my head because that was the day we had the, the parent meeting. Knowing how like um, behind you were, how did you leave that meeting? When I woke up, I had an anxiety attack in the bathroom and I threw up and I couldn't stop shaking. It just brought up my anxiety and I felt like I couldn't, I just couldn't because it was too much crowding my brain. He says he was able to overcome his anxiety by reconnecting with family and friends and finally realizing he could do the work. I know that I can perform a lot better than I'm performing this year even. There's a lot of life that I have to live after high school and if I don't work for what I want, then I'm not gonna have the life that I want. I, I can tell you that when they asked me for a list of names, I didn't have a long list of names for people who've come back and, and really have done it. And so, you know, what, what advice do you have for those students who are still struggling? I don't like coming to school, but I know that there's moments in the day where I have certain connections with people and, and have fun and have interesting encounters and learn fun things and have good memories. It's just, it's not all that bad. And the work isn't that much, if you really think about it. If you just like split it up, if you have a lot of missing work, just focus on one thing at a time and it'll go by in no time. We're all extremely proud of you, okay? Students, of course, have lots of questions about what school will look like in the coming years. To find out how the Biden administration plans to tackle education, I recently had the opportunity to share questions from students with the new Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona. Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, welcome and thank you so much for making the time. Thank you. So as we look to schools reopening, a lot of students are wondering what that new normal will look like and whether it's going to be the same as it was or whether we're going to take the lessons of the loss and the pain from this last year, especially this national conversation we're having about racism in America and applying them to schools. We have a related question coming now from Obsi Abibi, 15 years old from Bethesda, Maryland. Here's the question now. As a student of color, not only have I experienced many microaggressions throughout my academic career, but I've witnessed my fellow BIPOC students having similar experiences. What are your plans to address the overcriminalization and mistreatment of BIPOC students and disabled students within our schools? Mr. Secretary, what would you say to Opsi? She's absolutely right that we have to do a better job. Our students deserve better. The Office of Civil Rights is, is an office that's going to really be uh, leading a lot of this work to make sure that all students have the opportunity to achieve in schools that are welcoming, in schools that uh, embrace students, and embrace differences as, as an asset in their schools. So she's spot on. Efforts like restorative practices, which I'm very familiar with, are, are really the way to go to really engage students and build community and build a sense of uh, positive communication where uh, students feel em empowered to be part of the decision-making process in schools and re-engage in schools in a way that they haven't in the past. So I, I love that question and I'd love the opportunity to really work on that in our country. 
So a number of students are asking questions about learning loss and about the standards they're being held to. We have a question coming in that's related to that now from William Sniffen. He's 16 years old. He's from Cold Spring, New York. Here's William now. My question to you is, should teachers be more lenient to students because of COVID or should they follow with their normal criteria? What is your reasoning for this? That's a great question. I love hearing from students directly. So thank you for doing this. Uh, yes, I think we need to be responsible respectful of what students have experienced. Just like we are uh, respectful of what our educators have experienced, we have to make sure that we're taking into account the fact that many students are now coming back after having experienced uh, significant trauma in their lives. Some students have had loss of life in their family, which is significant. We have to connect socially and emotionally with them in order for the learning to take place. This is a question from 17-year-old Janice Aragon. She's a student in Brentwood, New York. Here's Janice's question. My school is one of the biggest in New York State, with over 5,000 students, many of which who are low income and minority. I want to ask, what will you do to help bridge the gap in education quality for disadvantaged communities like mine? Mr. Secretary, what would you say to Janice? That's a great question. I, I'm serving as Secretary of Education to really address those issues. We have an opportunity now to hit the reset button. The American Rescue Plan provides uh, funds and support and guidance around what practices uh, we should be following. And we need to be bold about addressing inequities that have uh, existed in our system and have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Many of these students had to be looking at uh, a screen for a year we have to make sure that we have uh, better interventions, that we have smaller class sizes, that we have uh, the, the academic enrichment and support that our students need, not only this spring and next year, but for years to come to close whatever gaps were worsened uh, due to the pandemic. Smaller class sizes for those students that need it most. Uh, our students with disabilities need additional support. We know that uh, Zoom learning isn't uh, the same for students that require that one-to-one -one, uh, support or that require hand-over-hand -hand manipulation if they're students that have sensory issues. So there's a lot of work to be done, and I know our educators are up for the challenge. Mr. Secretary, you have a lot on your plate, a lot of big decisions to make, and among the many questions we got were students asking where they fit into that conversation. I want to play for you one more question coming to us now from Reyes Martinez, 17 years old, from Michigan. Here is that question now. I went to a school board Zoom call and the adults were talking about whether the students should uh, go virtual or stay in person, but no one really asked how the students felt. So my question is, how can you help the students have their voices being heard in these decisions that affect their safety and their lives? Secretary Cardona, what would you say to Reyes? Uh, Reyes is spot on. And, you know, I, I think we really need to shift the paradigm. We're a service agency. We serve students and families. And we need systems, not only at the federal level, but at the state and at the local uh, district level and at the school level that keeps students at the center of the conversation. You know, students have voice. Sometimes the adults don't allow that voice into the conversation. We need to do better, especially in a pandemic. In systems that systematically include student voice, those are the ones where we see student leadership rise to a different level. Those are the ones where we see students really engaging and wanting to be in school. It just makes sense uh, that our systems are set up to listen to students, not just a one-off, um, but also in the schoolhouse, making sure that they're part of the decision-making process and all students, not just high-performing top 10 students, all students. We serve all students, their voices need to be at the table. I just want to send a big thank you to all of the students out there for submitting your questions and to you, Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona, for joining us today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gracie Napua Pomaika Kui Kalilo Frias, and we're going to talk about schools and stimulus money. We just heard from the Secretary of Education, who talked about wanting to help schools recover from the pandemic. This includes a huge bill called the American Rescue Plan. The Congress has recently passed. This bill includes $123 billion for K-12 schools. That's right, $123 billion, aka the largest one-time investment in K-12 education the government has ever made. I go to school here on Oahu in Hawaii. I've been mostly virtual since last year, but a couple of weeks ago, I had to go in person to take my biology state exam. That's when I noticed these big, huge vents in the ceiling. 
Turns out they were installed to help improve airflow and stop the spread of COVID. Modifying school buildings like this is just one of the ways schools can use their stimulus money. In fact, making schools safe for reopening is one of the only things they absolutely have to do. That and use at least 20% to help students who have fallen behind during the pandemic. Otherwise, schools have a lot of freedom when it comes to deciding where to direct their aid. So who in the district is making these decisions? Local governing bodies called school boards. School boards do a lot of things, but one of the most important jobs they have is deciding how the budget is spent. I don't think it's ever been more important to understand how school boards run and how you can get involved. If I could only think of one word to describe this year when it comes to teaching, it would be exhaustion, to be quite honest. We were trying desperately to figure out what was going on. We were building the plane while it was flying up in the air and hoping we weren't crashing and burning. Um, we didn't know how to reach our students, students didn't know how to reach us, and yet we were told somehow teach them. Tough is a nice way to put it. It's been frustrating, it's been annoying, it's been devastating. This will be my 19th year of teaching, but let me tell you, it feels like my first year. This pandemic kind of forced us to adapt kind of on the fly. Every day I never know how many kids I'll have in my room. What I've learned. Turn your camera on Thursday. Is that one of the most important important, important tools for teaching remotely is getting in touch with your own vulnerability. And not being scared to share it with your students. Overnight, we had to switch modes. Um, no more in-person, all online. And, and it was quickly apparent that not everybody was joining the class. And I never forget this moment. A student raises her hand and says, we've got each other. Let's not forget that. And so she said, I'll reach out to so-and-so. Somebody else said, oh, I could text this person. And, and somebody else said, I could swing by that person's house. And so as a small group, I think we did a good job of looking out for each other. This year, I really tried to allow students to tell their own stories. And that's where the breakthroughs came. I actually used an assignment from PBS Student Reporting Labs where students had to process how their lives have changed because of this pandemic, both personally and in education. And the answers that I got were so thought provoking for me as a teacher and really made me step back and think about my practice. What do I wish people outside the classroom understood about this past year and a half? The thing that's missing, the story that's missing in the national media, the national news, is success. These kids have created a tremendous amount of success in these classrooms. We've been pushing ourselves in ways unlike any other year, and it feels like we're going nowhere. But at the end of the day, I really feel like we've gone somewhere. It's just a different space, and we're stronger and we're better as a result. The thing that keeps me coming back every morning are the new ideas, the fresh ideas that are going to roll into next year. There are good days and bad days. And the most important thing is that our kids need us um, and we need to be there for them. So thank you. Living through the pandemic has taken a toll on everyone's mental health, but it's been especially tough for teens who are trying to figure out their place in the world. This next story comes to us from the hosts of a new Student Reporting Labs podcast called On Our Minds with Noah and Zion. They interviewed Edith Porter, a school mental health counselor at Caesar Rodney High School in Delaware, about this very tough year and what can be done to get students the help they need. You're about to watch that interview, but first, a teaser of On Our Minds. The first episode drops next Friday, May 28th, wherever you get your podcasts. Communicating through the screen, through Zoom. It's hard. It creates anxiety, creates anger. 
loneliness, fatigue. I feel like a lot of times this generation consume their emotions on social media. I think that's one thing that adults have really struggled to understand is it's very overwhelming in this time just to like exist. From PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs and WETA Wellbeings, this is On Our Minds with Noah and Zion, a podcast about teenagers and mental health because life is hard, really hard, and hearing stories about what other teens are going through and how they're getting better, it helps. It's okay to have bad moments. It's not an uphill climb. It's a mountain range. It's like a you, you kind of go up and down and all around. This podcast is a unique mix of stories, resources, and reporting. The heart of what adolescents, what everybody struggles with on the inside is, am I normal? Is this normal? And when is it a little bit too heavy? So I finally looked myself in the mirror and I just hugged myself. And for the first time in a year, I guess I felt love for myself. Listen to On Our Minds wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, Mrs. Porter. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. How are you? Thank you for having me. We keep hearing the phrase mental health crisis to describe what's going on with youth in the country. So do you feel like that term is right? Are we having a youth mental health crisis? Yes, I, I agree with the term. I came in October of last school year. I was here two weeks and I had a caseload of 70 students. Wow. This year, we had to bring on another mental health clinician to help with the load. Daily, I hear things like, um, my boyfriend broke up with me, to I'm being abused, there's sexual issues, kids are developing uh, things they say, panic and anxiety, language that they normally wouldn't use, they're starting to use. There was a crisis already, but now that COVID-19 has come into all of our lives, now it's sort of like another thing on top, right? Yeah. How did that affect you, you know, hearing all those kids' stories and what's going on in their lives and hearing how they're struggling? Thank you for asking that, Zayda. I'd be lying if I said, you know, sometimes I didn't go home and it was tough. But my job is to allow children to be heard and to help them to express their emotions. Here at Caesar Rodney, I do a coping skills group. For instance, today, I just said, tell me how you feel. Give me a word. You're not allowed to say good and okay. The young ladies, one lady said depressed. One lady said tired. One young lady said angry, fearful, frustrated. When we did a consensus, I missed an assignment. I slept for two weeks and now I have to play catch up. Does any of this sound familiar? No one's eyeing from your own. Absolutely, home. yeah. We need to realize that sometimes we need to take a break, you know? I mentioned to the students a lot, you know, in grad school, I, I received all A's one semester and one C plus. And that C plus was an A as far as I was concerned. You know why? I earned it. There was a lot going on. I was still proud of it. I don't want anybody to say, oh, Miss Porter is telling the children to fail. I want you to pass in life. Because nobody will care about that A if by the time you get it, you're not feeling good about yourself. It's important that you handle your mental state, your physical state, you know, and then the academic piece will come together. Are you seeing a rise in certain mental health conditions among your students? I know you mentioned like anxiety and you know depression, but are there any other? I'm seeing a rise in substance abuse and addiction. Unfortunately, sometimes students do they need hospital care. They need to go to a facility, you know, that will help, you know, get them off the drugs or at least give them a good start. You know, this is an organ if my heart starts to beat funny or skips a beat, I'm going to the doctor. <laughs> I need this. Sometimes our organs misfire and it's important that we get back on track. What do you predict for next school year? I predict next school year, we will be ready. There'll be more check-ins. I'm predicting that parents will be more open to resources. 
that we can have open conversations about race, about gender, about the pandemic, about mental health, about kindness, empathy, sympathy, because we've been disconnected and longing for connection. I predict that when we come together, we've learned something. We've learned how to treat each other a little bit better. What gives you hope right now regarding teens and our mental health? Well, I believe that young people are resilient. You've gone through a school year without being in school. You've gone through watching loved ones die. Just a lot of heartache. And so you're going to come back stronger. And you're going to use your voice. You're going to use your anger. You're going to use your strength to make a difference. The stigma of mental health will not be the same as in the past. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. Absolutely. It's great to just talk about how we're feeling and talk about mental health as a whole. That's really what we need to be doing, especially in a time like this. So thank you. Thank you. Zabri Green is back in high school in person, finishing up her senior year. But just a few months ago, she thought she might not be able to graduate. During winter break, she went to visit family in a rural part of Tennessee and learned they had COVID. She had to quarantine with them for over a month. At the time, her classes were all online and she couldn't connect. When I was there, no computer, no Wi-Fi, and I had my phone, but still no Wi-Fi. Zabri recently talked to her teacher, Deanna Duncan, about what she went through. They had a library, but the person I was staying with didn't have a car, and we was in the country. So, like, I would have walked, but it was far. What went through your brain when that, when you um, came to the realization that you might be there for a bit? I was like, well, I'm already, I'm already failing, and then now I have to stay here longer with no computer, no, no Wi-Fi nothing to do with school. I was, I was thinking about dropping out. So you were without um, internet access for like four weeks, four to six weeks. And uh, there are students all over the, the country that uh, haven't had it all year. Uh, so how does that make you feel like? If you're gonna require like kids to go to school, but then if they don't, they get like um, punished for it. Like, you know, like truancy or just um, like their grades are going to be bad that the state whoever like should make sure that every student has a laptop it's too early to know what the u.s high school dropout rate will be this year but globally the u.n estimates the pandemic could push 24 million students out of school fortunately zabri won't be among them she made it back to class and got a lot of support from her teachers and school administration to help her catch up how did the people welcoming you back make you feel here at school? It definitely like gave me motivation to like do my work because people were willing to help me and see my potential even if I didn't see it. I'm definitely proud and like I'm happy that I'm gonna get to graduate. And I'm proud of you too. Thank you. Distance learning definitely comes with its own challenges, but for some teenagers who'd previously experienced racism or discrimination at school, being online gave them a chance to thrive. Student reporter Jagger Barrington explores the upside of Zoom and how to make school better for everyone after the pandemic ends. My son came from a school that was very diverse, probably about 70% African-American to now being one of the few African American or children of color at all in school as well as staff. Erica Gilliam's 13-year-old son had a hard time when the family moved and he switched schools. He had some uh, behavioral interactions with students. We did have a few incidents that were uh, racially motivated. What did you expect from remote learning when the pandemic started? I thought sitting in front of a computer all day would affect his grades and just his social interaction. He is a pretty outgoing, extroverted child. He's actually been doing better 
in remote learning than he has uh, when he was in school. In many areas of the country, black parents have opted not to send their children back to school. For example, in Chicago, one-third of black families chose in-person classes compared to two-thirds of white families. I talked to Professor Cheryl Field Smith of the University of Georgia about this. One of the reasons black children in particular are being successful in virtual schooling is because no one's policing their body all day. He wakes himself up every day, walks the dog, makes himself breakfast, and he makes his own lunch in between classes. Like he's totally independent and it's, it's definitely been something that I was very surprised at. Dr. Teresa Chapel is an epidemiologist. She asked Black parents in a Facebook group about their virtual learning experiences. I got some deeper responses. Things like, my children are able to learn in a microaggression-free atmosphere. Um, and families started talking about the difference that learning in a loving environment and what how that changes just the level of stress that their children are under. Other responses I received were things like, I'm able to interact more with the teacher in real time. One specific group was parents of ADHD students who said that my child fidgets a lot in school. This has been um, one opportunity for their child to learn in a way that feels comfortable to them, but not be disruptive of others in the class. Bullying is another reason students felt more comfortable at home. Deja stopped going to school just before the pandemic and is now homeschooled. Just so as long as everyone was bothering me in school, I was never able to focus on my work. I was also targeted for my race. I got used to doing work online instead of in the classroom. And when quarantine was, you know, happening, I guess it didn't feel too bad because even if I wanted to go to school, I couldn't. I have to say I've been doing really good for the past few weeks or even months. I mean, I don't, I don't feel so bad about who I am or myself anymore. Some students feel freed by not being seen at school. Sitting in Zoom classes, I only have half my face showing like this. Um, but I still think about how I'm perceived, unfortunately, and I reflect on that as well as like gender performance in general. It's not being perceived either under a mask or online has given me so much mental freedom. As I started working on this report, I realized I was also one of the students who thrived this year away from my school. I looked different from other students, white students. I was getting called out a lot, didn't have many friends. It was challenging to work and going to school became miserable. But online, the teacher taught everyone else the same and I could learn the way that I wanted to. How can we make schools less discriminatory for black students? I think we need to look at our policies and practices that um, tend to affect black and brown children um, more than other children, like our discipline rules. Giving black children and brown children more voice and choice in their learning. And you'd be surprised how black children, white children, all children will rise to the occasion when they have ownership over their own learning. Dr. Chapel says schools must earn back trust. Everyone that said that we need to reopen in-person school for equity reasons needs to know that that's not equity. Having the doors open is not where equity starts or stops. And that what is necessary in order for equity is to ensure that Black and minority students have equal access to educational opportunities within their schools. His school gave us the opportunity to go back. I was very surprised when we presented this to my son and he's like, no, thank you. I'd rather stay home. With public gatherings canceled, postponed, or limited during the pandemic, young Americans turned to social media to connect and create together. They increasingly turn to platforms like Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok. In fact, the number of Americans active on TikTok has skyrocketed from 11 million in 2018 to over 100 million today. To understand these changes, let's hear now from content creators who saw their popularity soar during the pandemic. Hey everyone, I'm Taylor Trudon, and I'm a New York-based journalist who writes and reports on Gen Z and social media culture. I'm here with an awesome group. Curtis Roach is a 21-year-old musician and influencer from Detroit, Michigan. 
He went from rapping at open mics when he was 15 to performing at festivals alongside notable acts like Billie Eilish. He's most known for his 2020 viral song, Bored in the House. Bored in the house and I'm in the house bored. Taylor Cassidy is 18. She is best known as a viral TikTok personality dedicated to elevating Black culture, history, and voices. With a fast grown audience of over 2 million followers, Taylor uses her platform to spread love, positivity, and education. Go on, put it on. And finally, John Barnes is also 18. He's a senior at H.B. Woodlong Secondary Program in Arlington, Virginia. John is also the co-host of an upcoming SRL digital series on explaining mental health. I'm so excited to be having this conversation with you today, which I think is more relevant than ever before. How has creating content help the process of the disruption that COVID has created. What we're still going through is like, you know, people are losing loved ones and stuff. So it was kind of like a thing where I was seeing a lot of comments of people just coming to my page to, you know, laugh or enjoy themselves in any way possible through the internet. A lot of times every day just felt like the same day. So content creating gave me something to look forward to. There's always people I can find that are maybe like maybe going through similar experiences that I would have never expected. I want to know how your mental health has been affected. This is something that we are not supposed to really go through, you know, these extended periods of isolation or maybe just functioning normally when it's not, the world's not functioning as it should be. So when I would finish those projects that I worked so hard on, I still just didn't feel anything. I think that's because this has probably been the worst mental health I've ever had. I got diagnosed with depression, started antidepressants, and I found out a lot of things about myself that I didn't really know. And this was all kind of accelerated by the pandemic. My mental health has been on a roller coaster ever since the pandemic. I would feel like um, content creating was a passion of mine, but it started to feel like more of like an obligation to like top the last viral video and then I'll be happy or top the last um, number of comments and then I'll be successful. Being in isolation and not having that outside perspective offline to really bring you back down to earth really messes with your sense of reality. You open your phone and you see like so many different negative um, news articles as far as just, you know, there's a mass shooting somewhere or, you know, a black life is t taken away by the police every day. You know what I'm saying? Those things just make you want to lose your mind after a while. I'm wondering what's it like having people pay attention to what you're making? Like, does it feel weird? Is it cool? Is it a mixture of both? Whenever people started like subscribing, following it like in masses. And I actually realized, oh wait, my content is actually like impacting people. And like, it actually serves like a pretty awesome purpose. I had to kind of like take a step back and try and come to terms with the fact that I will never be able to fully understand the amount of people that look at my videos or look at my content. What other ways can adults use social media specifically to engage with young people in a way that feels authentic? Because so many times we see older generations try and use social media to talk to the kids and it's just so cringy. I'll say this, read the room. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like everybody should just like look at what they're about to post and be like, is this, is this uh, appropriate? Or am I just speaking to hear myself talk? Is this an educated opinion? Or am I just, is this just an opinion that I'm just trying to get out so I can have all my other friends that I went to high school with years ago agree with me on Facebook or something like that? What do you think are the biggest misconceptions that adults, educators get wrong about social media. Even like older millennials like minimize people who use social media or people who create on social media to just doing like TikTok dances and taking pictures of their food and that's it. And we're just like all obsessed with that. Everyone who uses social media is there for 
one reason and it's because they want to be inspired. I think social media is a great place, especially I've seen TikTok is just people asking questions on accounts with maybe people who are a trusted source, like a therapist or some kind of educator, medical professional, because they don't have that resource right them in their household or at their school. Do you think social media has changed the way kids learn? I think in education, it's a lot easier now to lose kids' attention if you don't connect it to something that they can take away and post on social media. Literally, most of my Black history videos have come from the classroom. So how I interacted with my education, I was like, mm, I can take this topic and post it on my social media. So social media has really shortened kids' attention spans, but it's also given them something to look for content and look for a story. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and your experiences. This has been such an insightful conversation. So thank you. Thank you. You had a great time. This has been literally so insightful and amazing. You guys are so smart. Seriously. I'm going to like notes app all of this. <laughs>
That is really impressive. <laughs> um, seriously, all of you. Um, and how about you, Eamon? I want to go into like the film industry and like entertain it. I ended up taking a gap year, which I didn't originally intend to do. And I think the pandemic helped me really see that I really want to do this as my career because um, when everything else seemed like a drag and like something I didn't want to do and I had no motivation, uh, making videos and doing film uh, always gave me inspiration. From talking to your friends, how do you think attitudes about college have changed? I just think a lot more kids have chosen to go to community college because if you're not certain what a four-year institution is going to be like, the experience, then I think a lot of kids were like, might as well go to a community college for two years and then two years from now, just transfer into a four-year and get the same degree. Social media has opened up a lot of jobs that don't really require college anymore, which is like open up your own business, like online business or anything like that. My parents both didn't go to college and my dad currently has his own business. I feel like the internet and social media has opened up for many students. In five years, how do you hope the college admission process and college culture change for students because of the pandemic? And we can start with you, Sean, for this one. My main hope is that the SAT and some of those stricter requirements that affect lower income students more are just taken away. And I would say better analyses of the students themselves instead of a random test score. Sean made a great point. I do agree with um, taking out the SATs and if they haven't already, just to make virtual learning as like another option. I completely agree with what they were saying about standardized testing. It's a little bit outdated. I also think colleges themselves will change. They'll have better infrastructure for disease control because all the colleges turned into hotspots when they shut down and they weren't really prepared for the pandemic. So I think they'll be better prepared to switch to virtual learning if necessary. Well, as your final school year wraps up, I'd like to say congratulations to the entire class of 2021 and all of you guys. I know you guys have worked so hard and it's almost done. <laughs> Good luck to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really thought that college would be something that like our counselors would guide us through and like we'd get a lot of help with, but that got changed for me obviously when I wasn't able to be in person. You know, I tried to apply to college and you're not gonna get the right direction if there is nobody to show you the way, the right way, like in face to face. I'm not sure if I got in or not because I'm literally confused confused on what I'm doing. So I might take a year off if that didn't work. Some colleges require you to take the SAT testing. So when I applied twice to take the SAT testing, both times were canceled because of either a uh, closing or too many students in a building at once. So I couldn't apply to those colleges. I'm just now visiting the colleges that I already applied to to see if I want to go there it like it almost causes you to apply to even more schools than you would originally have to this upcoming year I'm planning to take a gap year um, and then apply to the colleges that I want to go to I think college is more important to me now because of COVID because missing out on a bit of high school basically means that I'm not as prepared so college is more of a necessity a lot of things got in the way a lot of self-reflecting so I don't think I'm going to college I didn't really know what I wanted to do before the pandemic started. Now I can see myself as being a nurse or a special education teacher. It has made me think about my future career in a different, from a different angle, specifically like how expendable would my job be in times of crisis. I had always known that I'd wanted to pursue a career in the health professions. The COVID-19 pandemic enlightened me as to what the responsibilities of that job really were. and. It, it presented it in a very realistic and raw light. I couldn't even imagine leaving high school and looking forward to like your college experience and all that kind of stuff and then having to do it online. To me, that would just feel like disappointing, especially for people who have been looking forward to like leaving their like home situation and going off to college. I feel like that would definitely suck. The future is just so uncertain. I don't even know where to really go with it. I think. Maybe a lot of my peers around the country might feel that way too. It's just a totally different thing for us all to navigate. And I mean, we're all in it together. It's just a really weird time to grow up. 
a huge thank you to everyone who contributed to this show. I know we just barely scratched the surface of the many ways the pandemic disrupted education, but every one of these stories holds the seeds of change. They opened a window into how today's teens are rethinking school, and hopefully they'll lead to more conversations ahead. At the heart of this program were the students who shared their most personal struggles and challenges, all in the hopes of helping others in similar situations. I hope you are as inspired by their creativity and their resilience as I am. It is your voices, student voices, that are critical to solving these problems, and not just in education, but for the many challenges our country faces. We need to hear from you now more than ever. So thank you for being a part of our conversation tonight. Thank you also to everyone else for joining us. On behalf of the whole team, I'm Amna Nawaz. Please stay safe, be well, and good night.